morning, everybody. Let's go ahead and stand and sing together. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your church, and we need your power in us. We seek your kingdom first. We hunger and we thirst. Refuse to waste our joy and prize to see the captive hearts released the hurt the sick the poor at peace we lay down our lives for heaven's cause we are your church and we pray revive this earth let's sing it out together Build your kingdom here, let the darkness fear, show your mighty hand, heal our streets and lands, set your church on fire, win this nation back, change the your kingdom's power, reaching the near and far, no force of hell can stop, your beauty changing hearts, you made us for much more than this, awake the kingdom seed in us, fill us with the strength and love of Christ. your church and you are the hope on earth. Let's sing it together. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand. Heal our streets and lands. Set your church on Let's pray this morning. Father, as we continue our study uh, through your Sermon on the Mount, uh, where we discuss your expectations uh, for kingdom living, God, we just ask that you would continue to uh, draw our hearts and our minds to worship. And Father, we look forward to this time together as family in Christ's name. Amen. We'll sing one more together, 10,000 Reasons. Really quick, is my guitar on back there, Waldo? Is this on, the guitar? Yep, okay. Just making sure. My ear's been kind of weird this morning, and I couldn't hear it. (laughs) All right, let's sing this together. 10,000 reasons. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul. Oh, my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship your holy name. The 
sing one more together, Blessed Assurance. Just the, the, the amazing assurance that we have in Christ and his finished work on the cross and the fact that our story reflects the love that he has for us. Let's sing these words together as we worship him. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. The heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. 
perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight, angels descending, bring from above, echoes of mercy, whispers of This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long and third is the last perfect submission all is at rest i and my savior am happy and blessed watching and waiting looking above with his goodness lost in his love this is my story this is my song praising my savior all the day long this is my story this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Amen. You can be seated. Just a handful of announcements this morning. I did leave my bulletin at the back, uh, but I know what's going on this week. Um, just to remind everybody, uh, Pastor Mark will be back starting tomorrow. So the Wednesday morning Bible study is back on for this week. As well, on Wednesday evenings, uh, we had our first of hopefully many prayer and praise gatherings uh, here in the cafe. It was such a great time. Marilyn led us in uh, some great choruses and hymns, and we shared in prayer and an encouraging testimony with one another. Uh, so that's Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. We'd love for you to be able to come out and be a part of that in the cafe. Um, our shift summer hangout group that meets on Fridays is going to be taking a break. We will be starting back up again on August 13th. Uh, we're taking a break because I have surgery on Tuesday, uh, so you can be in prayer for that. Uh, so I'll uh, probably not be in the best shape to be playing dodgeball for a couple of weeks. Uh, so th that is going to be on a break until the 13th. And the last announcement that I have this morning, Paul, I lost it. You're going to have to make sure I get the time right. Tomorrow morning at 7, or tomorrow morning, <laughs> tomorrow evening at 7 p.m., we have a deacons meeting here at the church. If it's at 7 a.m., I mean, I'm up, but I'm drinking coffee, so I'm not sure if I'll be here. <laughs> all right. Uh, I believe that's all that I have for announcements this morning. Is there anything, church family, that I'm missing? Yes, there is. I just remembered one. Uh, starting next week, uh, as you guys know, we've had seating available here and in the cafe as well as in our downstairs auditorium. Uh, starting next week, the downstairs auditorium, we're going to start using that again for junior church. Uh, so seating will only be available here and in the cafe, but we've noticed over the last month or so that uh, we've been able to fit everybody and still have extra room in the cafe as well. Uh, so that shouldn't be an issue seating-wise. Uh, we're still so thankful that everybody can be out. Um, let's go ahead and stand together. We're going to sing two more songs before we look into the word. One of my favorite hymns is What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And... Uh, I, cha I always change the verse order because in, in the hymnal it goes verse 1, 2, 3, but I love to sing verse 2 last. And that's because there's this incredible second stanza where it says, can we find a friend so faithful 
who will all our sorrows share. Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. And this song just, just reminds us of the friendship and the love that we share with Christ and the fact that regardless of our situation, regardless of our circumstances, we have somebody that we can go to just as Peter writes, and we can cast our cares on him because he does care for us. So let's go ahead and sing this together. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden, covered with a load of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge, take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise, forsake thee, take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee, thou wilt find a solace there. Have we trials? Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Sing that again. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Amen. You can have a seat for this last song. Thinking of the songs that we have sung this morning, recognizing God's authority, his love for us, the assurance that we have, and the friendship that we have with him. Uh, I think it's fitting that the song that we sing before we look into the word this morning is Living Hope, because we do serve a living Savior, and the hope that he offers is very much alive and powerful today. So let's sing this together. <laughs> How great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living. could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace 
the God of ages step down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Let's sing hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Let's sing hallelujah. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me Jesus yours is the victory and hallelujah Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. And hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. God, you are my living hope. Amen. Thanks for singing with us this morning. This time I'm going to let the little ones head on to Junior Church, which is in the gym this week, but next week it'll be downstairs. Before we look into the word, just take a a few minutes just to uh, spend some time in prayer together. I do want to say I was talking to Nathan this morning, and our big prayer request today is that it may be possible for Nathaniel to be home 
tomorrow. So our prayer today is that God will work out what needs to be worked out so Nathaniel can be home uh, as soon as possible. Do also be uh, continuing to pray for day camp. Uh, we began opening registration this week, and we've already had eight kids sign up. Uh, we're really looking forward to seeing, uh, to seeing that number filled, being able to have kids here uh, for day camp in August. Continue to pray for uh, the planning and the execution of that. And if you have some spare time around August 16th through 20th and want to help out, let me know because I can put you to work. And we'd love to be able to have you uh, kind of on that team. Let's just look to the Lord in prayer. Father, this morning, we're just so mindful of the blessing that it is to be here, to be in your word, and to be together as family. Uh, God, we pray that you would bless our study as we continue through Matthew chapter 5. Uh, and God, as we think of, of all those who are not able to be here with us this morning, we do just pray for your continued blessing and healing and intervention. God, we think of Nathaniel. We uh, so long to see him be able to come home. God, we just ask that you just open the doors uh, and continue to make necessary everything that needs to fall into place so that uh, if it be your will that he could be home as soon as tomorrow, God, that would be so, uh, so awesome and so amazing. And we know that nothing is too difficult for you. We know that nothing is out of your reach. So if this would be your will, we do just ask that you would accomplish it. Uh, and Father, as we think of day camp coming up, uh, we do just continue to, to thank you for, for blessing us with the facilities and the ability to, to have a ministry like day camp. And we just ask that you would uh, continue to cause the details to fall into place and that you would just begin even today working on the hearts of the young people who will be here, uh, who will be exposed to the word of God and, and the saving gospel message. So we do just give that to you. And now this morning as we look into the word, uh, we just ask that you would bless it in Christ's name. Amen. So, first things first, I need to apologize. I made a boo-boo last week. I was a panderer of misinformation, and I deserve to be lynched. I'm just kidding. Uh, but I did, I did make a mistake last week. Uh, last week in my uh, discussion as we were talking about Christ's fulfillment of the law, I made a cultural reference that when I said it, it did not line up with what I had written. And so last week I made the statement uh, that the scribes and Pharisees taught from a collection of writings known as the Talmud. Now, here's the thing that's partially true. In reality, the Talmud itself was not actually written and put together until around four or 500 AD. At the time of Christ, these were all oral traditions and oral teachings. But last week, I said they were written. That's not okay. Don't let me do that, guys. You guys have to, you guys gotta keep me accountable here. Uh, so just please, please, please forgive me for that uh, minor infraction. Um, again, the, 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 the principle remains that during this time as Christ was bringing this message of the gospel and this idea of kingdom-centered living, the focus of, of his teachings was to liberate uh, the people from the oppression of this pharisaical teaching that said, you have to work your way to God. And Jesus says, no, you can't work your way to God. But once you have come to God and received salvation freely, there still is a standard that we have to live by. Uh, so I hope me messing up a historical date doesn't uh, cause anybody to stumble too hard. This morning, uh, just kind of recap where we were. Uh, again, last week we were uh, in the Old Testament. Waldo, I'll get you to throw up um, the... There we go. So last week we began in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 uh, through 20, and we talked about Christ's teaching on the Old Testament and how we were taking a turn into a new section in the Sermon on the Mount uh, where Jesus was going to represent to the people aspects of the Old Testament Mosaic law and give them their full meaning, their full understanding and interpretation. 
and really elevate these laws uh, to a level which was way more unattainable than originally presented. Um, Last week, as we broke down verses 17 through 20, we talked about how Jesus refers to the law and the prophets, and those two things form the Old Testament, the law being the books of Genesis through Deuteronomy, the prophets being Joshua through Malachi, and we talked about the Mosaic law specifically. We talked about how it breaks down into three aspects. There's civil, ceremonial, and moral law within uh, the Old Testament. The civil laws dealt with government, how Israel was to conduct itself as a nation. The ceremonial laws referred to the priesthood, how Israel was designed to worship God. It talks about the sacrificial system. And we talked about how the sacrificial system was designed so that uh, the, the sins of the people could be placed on the innocent blood of an animal and therefore paints the picture of the full sacrifice that Christ would pay on the cross with his own life as the perfect spotless lamb of God. And then finally, there was the moral law. In the moral law, we boiled down to two terms, love God and love your neighbor. And within that boundary, there is so many laws in the Old Testament that discuss what that's supposed to look like. We talked about things like uh, lying, murdering, adultery. We talked about all those things that are in uh, the Ten Commandments and in those other books, uh, Exodus through Deuteronomy. And all of these things that in the Old Testament were designed to influence uh, the relationship that Israel had with itself, with the people around it, but most importantly, with God. And we talked about that j- how Jesus fulfills the Old Testament and f- lived under the Mosaic Law, completed it fully to the letter, and we asked the question, if Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament, if he fulfilled all the prophecies, if he lived according to the law and was the only person in human, human history to do so, do we still need the Old Testament today? And our answer was, oh, you guys are making me really nervous. Okay, yes. <laughs> Last week we said it was a resounding yes. The Old Testament is still incredibly profitable. It enlightens our understanding of everything that Christ was meant to do and, and everything that he is for us. It tells us the history of mankind, but most importantly, it contains the moral law, those standards by which God still holds us to today. We recognize that in Christ's fulfillment of the Mosaic law, the ceremonians, there, there's many ceremonial and civil aspects that don't apply to us today. I can still eat bacon today. That's fantastic. I had some the other day, and I'm very happy about that. Uh, back, in, back in the time of, of, of Israel in the Old Testament, they weren't allowed to. Um, so there are certain laws today that obviously do no longer apply, but we understand that the moral laws passed down from God we're still very much on the hook for. And Christ actually elevates these things. And that's where we're at today. We're going to talk about this first law, and we're going we're gonna to dive into this idea of murder. And I think as we, as we break it down this morning, uh, you're going to see why Jesus starts here. Because uh, there's, there's all sorts of laws that Jesus could have started with when we look at the Old Testament, even if he was just doing the Ten Commandments, we could, we, could, we could pinpoint there's a handful of rules that he could have stuck with there. He could have started with something a little bit more light, like, you know, maybe don't lie. You know, that's a little, you know, a little less heavy. But no, he starts with the idea of murder. And this morning as we read through uh, this passage and as we break it down, I think we're going to see why uh, this was such a point of, of, of focus for Jesus here in Matthew chapter 5. So if, so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Matthew chapter 5, and we'll read verses 21 through 26. So Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, it says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. 
First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come to offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you're on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, and the judge hand you over to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. And assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. So these are some pretty serious words this morning from Jesus. So we're just going to break this down uh, as, as we always do. We know I like to break things down into threes. And we're going to look at the first thing here in verse 21. We're going to look at the original commandment. What do we read in verse 21? Jesus says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder. And whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. So this commandment, do not murder. We see this first in Exodus chapter 20. Uh, verse 13. It's given to Moses by God at the top of Mount Sinai among the other uh, Ten Commandments. Now, here's what we need to get out of the way that I think we all can appreciate this morning. God has always held life as sacred. He has always held life as sacred. Uh, As early as Genesis chapter 4 when we read the account of Cain killing his brother Abel, God asserts judgment for those who would hold life in contempt. He punishes Cain so greatly because Cain took life that was not his to take. In Genesis chapter 9, verses 5 through 6, after he, has, after he had purged the world with the flood, and now Noah and his family remain, Jesus says to Noah, he sets this precedent of life for life. In Genesis 9, verses 5 and 6, he, God says to Noah, whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God, man was created. God takes life very seriously. And he takes the taking of life very, very seriously. We know from the very beginning in Genesis that God created mankind in his image. And what this means is that we possess will, intellect, and emotion. It's what sets us apart from the rest of creation. So God holds life in a very sacred, sacred position. And to take life is to assault the very image of God. Because if man is created in the image of God and I seek to destroy that which is created in the image of God, then I am assaulting the image of God itself. And that's why God says in Genesis chapter 9 that if man sheds another man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. There is this life for life understanding in the Old Testament. And when we read through the Mosaic Law especially, uh, this is something that that is dwelt on for, 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 for quite a few verses. This idea that life is sacred and should be protected. Human life at every stage should be respected and reverenced. And, and as, as I'm saying this, I recognize that this probably seems like a relatively easy concept to grasp. God made us, life has meaning, so don't kill anybody. I'm pretty sure everybody in this room is safe fr- from that. I don't think anybody here has murdered anybody. Uh, I can't speak for the cafe right now because I can't see who's out there. Um. <laughs> but seriously, w- it seems like a really easy concept. We understand that life has meaning, so we don't kill each other. That, ju- that, that makes sense. And that's what the people of Israel believed and were taught for almost 1,500 years. As a part of, the, of the, 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 pharis- the pharisaical teaching, the teaching of the scribes and the Pharisees, it was well understood that this law simply meant don't kill anybody. That, that's a pretty easy thing to do. Don't kill anybody. And that was one of, it was one of those laws that frankly made it really easy to follow and made for a really easy notch on the bar of the self-righteous. If you're trying to say that you keep the law, there's there's a handful of laws there that it's really easy to say, well, I've kept those. Well, I haven't murdered anybody. I haven't slept with somebody else's wife. You know, it's really easy to kind of put those things onto the docket. However, what Jesus is about to explain in verse 22 is that this, this commandment to not murder goes so much deeper than we understand. And it is so much heavier, and there is so much more at play. 
And frankly, he's about to, to elevate this commandment to a level that, that frankly, uh, as I read this, and I think we as family, as we read this this morning, it, sh- it should intimidate us a little bit. We should be intimidated by the, uh, the, the level to which God elevates life and the contempt thereof. So we understand the original commandment. We see it in Exodus. God's always held life as sacred. Because we are made in the image of God, to kill someone is to assault the very image of God, and human life at every stage should be respected and reverenced. We get that. That's fantastic. So let's look at, well, what's, what's the new depth here? Well, what's this new level that God is going to add here to this idea of murder? Well, let's read it together. In verse 22, Jesus says, But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Jesus expands the cultural understanding here in verse 22 by by taking this commandment, do not kill, and he takes it one massive step further. Jesus asserts that murder is not simply committed in action, but also in thought and word. And he gives the example of, of unrighteous anger and destructive insults. That's, that's pretty significant. I think there's a big difference between uh, anger and, and, and saying something verbally and, and plunging a knife into somebody. But on, uh, as far as God's concerned, harboring hate or disdain for another individual holds the same moral equivalence as murder in the eyes of God. By hating your neighbor, you are hating someone that is made in the image of God. We as human beings are created in the image of God and God does not take that lightly. So to hate or to lash out against someone who is created in the image of God, God takes that very seriously. Furthermore, uh, becoming angry and assuming a position of superiority as we see here when it says, um, and whoever says to his brother, Raka or you fool, Whenever we become angry and assume a position of superiority over another and call them a derogatory name, this demonstrates the the sinfulness of our hearts. What does Jesus say? It's not what goes in that defiles you, but it's what comes out. Because our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked, and what comes out shows who we really are. So let's let's look at these two words, raka and fool. Well, Raka that we see here, it says, whoever says to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. Now, this was a colloquial expression uh, of contempt t- towards somebody's mind or their intellect. Um, to put it into modern terms, uh, it would be the equivalent of calling somebody an idiot, a numbskull, uh, if you guys are fans of Charlie Brown, blockhead. Uh, it's, it's, th- it's this idea, not in a joking manner, uh, but in a serious uh, condemning uh, manner to show contempt for somebody's mind, for somebody's thought process, their intelligence level. And Jesus says that anybody who insults their brother in this way out of anger should be put to the council. Culturally, this meant an investigative intervention within the synagogue or obviously in our context within, within the church. He said if you have a brother who in anger lashes out against another and openly shows contempt for, for their thinking or their, their, their intelligence, well, then there needs to be some sort of conversation. There needs to be some sort of intervention there because that is the heart showing something deeper that's going on. Because in all honesty, how long do we have to be harboring certain thoughts like that? How long do we have to be harboring certain intentions before we're willing to spew them out? In the book of Exodus, one of the names that describes God, one of the characteristics that describes him, it says, slow to anger. Slow to anger. We sang about that this morning. In the original Hebrew, slow to anger literally means long of nose. Are you tracking with me? That makes sense, right, Andrew? Sure. (laughs) To be slow to anger, it means long of nose, because when you watch cartoons, and, your char- and the character starts getting, getting angry, what happens? Their face begins to turn 
red. And the longer your nose is, the longer it's going to take for that thermometer to fill up with red before you're ready to explode and, 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 and lash out in anger. So in the Bible, when we read that God is slow to anger, it literally means he has a very long nose. It takes him a long time to come to any sort of tipping point where it comes outward. So when we read words like raka that show contempt, or as we're going to talk about fool, which also shows, shows outward contempt, it all begins in the heart. And it all begins in, in, in a hatred and a contempt for the individuals around us. So that's raka. It's a contempt for somebody's mind. Fool, in the original context, refers to expressing contempt towards somebody's character. This goes, this goes even one step further. To call somebody a fool is to condemn them for their character. In both instances that Raka and Fool are used, I, 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 I got to be really clear about this. This is not referring to sarcasm, to joking conversation. Um, Blair will call me an idiot, and I know he still loves me. At least I hope so. Um, but that's not what we're talking about here, right? This is talking about a rage-fueled condemnation of another person. Literally saying that this person is better off dead to me because of their thought process, because we're, we're, we have a disagreement, because there is anger there. And Jesus says, later he says, whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hellfire. Jesus does not take this lightly. He says that individuals who act this way, who lash out because of harbored hatred and anger, he literally says that they are in danger of hellfire. Now, this word hellfire, uh, the Greek word used here is Gehenna, which is a Greek translation of the Hebrew Valley of Hinnom. Now, the Valley of Hinnom is this valley south of Jerusalem uh, that was literally constantly burning. It was a large fire where they would throw their trash, their refuse, all the things that they needed to get rid of would go to the Valley of Hinnom, and there was this constant burning fire that was ready to consume all that the city of Jerusalem was casting off. And this, this idea of Gehenna, this, this ever-continuing fire, uh, it became a symbol and, frankly, an appropriate go-to name when discussing the punishment that awaits those who are not found in Christ. And Jesus is, is, is pretty clear here. He says, whoever lashes out in anger is in danger of condemnation. Now, does this mean we can lose our salvation? No, absolutely not. But when we see brothers and sisters acting in this way, there should be an encouragement for repentance. If there, if there is this action of anger and hatred with a lack of repentance, then, then there needs to be a conversation urging them to repentance. And we're going to talk about that uh, a little further on. But when it comes to this idea of holding contempt for those around us, God takes it very seriously, and Jesus takes it very, very seriously. James the half-brother of Jesus, actually spoke on this subject as well in his letter to the dispersed church. In James chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, uh, James writes this, Do not speak evil of one another, brethren, for he who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? What James is saying here is if we're going to lash out in anger at another human being created in the image of God, when we have been expressly told in the law of God not to do so, in that moment, we're taking the law into question. We're questioning the authority of God. We're questioning the, the authenticity of God. James says there is only one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. There's only one lawgiver capable of condemning, and that is God. And James literally says, who are we to judge one another in anger? To harbor hate towards another individual or to lash out verbally 
is to take God's law into your own hands. When we harbor hatred, and when we express that hatred for those around us, we are literally engaging in spiritual vigilantism, and God's not going to stand for it. These are serious, serious accusations that Jesus is making this morning. And that's why it was so important last week for us to understand that, that yes, we're not bound to the, the, the civil and the ceremonial laws that, that the, the people of Israel were in the Old Testament, which seem so strict and so focused. But if we are followers of God, the law that we are called to follow is so much more important. It's so much more significant. Are these, are these rules that we're meant to follow so that we can be saved? Of course not. No, because the whole purpose of the law is to show us that we are incapable of living to God's standard. That's why God sent Christ to pay the price for our sins on the cross, to offer the freedom of salvation. And by accepting that free gift of salvation, now we can have a changed life. There, there's an expression, God meets us where we are, but he doesn't plan to leave us that way. These, these points in the Sermon on the Mount, and we're going to continue over the next number of weeks talking about these things, but there's a real weight to them because as followers of God, our life is supposed to look different. To harbor hate towards another is to take God's law into our own hands when we judge another in anger and claim superiority over them, and this is the serious part, when we without cause and without support of God's word lash out in anger against another individual, when we condemn, we are guilty of assuming the position of God and that is blasphemy. Jesus is not playing games here when he says that whoever, call, whoever says to their brother Raka or calls them fool will be in danger of hellfire. We are in no place to assume the position of God. And again, let me be clear. This is not the same as, as reaching out with the truth in love. Those are two different things. So, here we are, we have the original commandment. Now we have this new depth. And I don't know about you guys, but it, it, it feels kind of heavy on my shoulders this morning. So how do we deal with this? Well, thankfully, in verses 23 through 26, Jesus actually gives a very clear resolution. And I, I won't read these because we, we, we've already read them, but in verses 23 through 25, Jesus gives uh, culturally for them to understand then a response to this issue. In his example, he says that if you're coming to worship knowing that you've failed in this area, don't proceed to worship until you've dealt with it. Uh, James chapter 3, verses 8 and 10 highlights that the tongue, as small of a muscle as it is within our body, does so much destruction. He says that our tongue in one moment will praise God, but in another moment will curse man who is made in the image of God. And James says, these two cannot coexist. These things don't work together. It's, 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 it's water and oil. This, this isn't how, it's, it's not going to work. These things are polar opposites. So what Jesus is saying here is if you have hatred, you cannot properly worship God. What, is, what does John say? In John chapter 1, or first John. First John chapter four, verse seven says this. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. If we are harboring hate and not love, we have to sort some things out before we can have fellowship and worship with God. Because worship, at the end of the day, it's an expression of our love for God 
through giving back to him the gifts that he has so graciously given to us, whether it's through song, whether it's through physical giving, whether it's through time spent together in the word and fellowship. Giving back to God what he has given to us out of love, that, that's what worship is. But if we're cursing a man made in the image of God, we cannot say that we love God. That's the crux. When we say love God and love your neighbor, it's not that simple. Because to love God fully, we have to express that love to our neighbor. And if we truly love our neighbor, then we should love God. So what do we do? Frankly, Jesus simply says, deal with it. He says, if you have a root of bitterness, cut it off. If you're holding on to contempt, let go of it and repent. The Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, to not let the sun go down on your anger. If there's anger, if there's frustration, which family there's going to be, we're human. We rub each other the wrong way. But God says we're supposed to deal with it, not let it fester, not let it turn into heart-level murder. If we're to be seen as kingdom citizens, if we are to be seen as followers of Christ, our lives must be marked by love and not hatred. So reconciliation must be achieved. No matter who takes the first step, whether it's the person who is offended or the person who has been offended, there needs to be steps towards reconciliation. In verse 24 through 26, uh, Jesus gives this kind of cultural example where he talks about uh, taking it to court. Now, culturally speaking, during this time, it was very common for a dispute to go straight to what was called the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was a group of 70 uh, Jewish elders that served as a court. So what Jesus is saying uh, is even on the way to a court trial, the defendant should be seeking to, to clear up any issues. Otherwise, the Sanhedrin could send him to prison and he could lose everything. And that's why Jesus says, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, and the judge hand you to the officer, and you be thrown in prison. And assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there until you have paid the last penny. In that day, culturally, murder had a pretty high cost. And Jesus is saying we need to treat our interactions with others, those interactions of hatred, we need to treat it the same way. You need to have respect and love for those around you. So what do we do if we've committed heart murder? Simple, we need to seek reconciliation. We need to humble ourselves, repent, and offer restitution. This needs to take place for for a handful of reasons. One, so that we can maintain unity within the body of Christ because we're going to offend each other. So we need to seek reconciliation. We need to take this family seriously. Second, it's so that we can maintain our fellowship with the Lord. If one is truly saved, we cannot lose our salvation, but that doesn't mean that fellowship's always going to be the greatest thing. I know my dad's going to listen to this sermon, but I know he's not going to mind me saying this. There have been times where my father and I have not seen eye to eye, and he has never stopped being my father. But there has certainly been times where our fellowship hasn't been that strong. And in the same way, our heavenly father will never let us go But if we are going to continue to sin, if I personally continue to harbor hate and indignation, my fellowship with him is going to be strained. So we need to seek restitution. We need to seek reconciliation so that we can maintain the unity of the kingdom, maintain fellowship with the Lord, and most importantly, set an example to the unbelieving world of what it means to be a follower of Christ. Two weeks ago, we talked about being salt and light in the world. And we do that by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And once we have done that, seeking to live a life that reflects that decision. So this this has been a lot to unpack this morning. In 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 just a few short verses, we've we've taken something simple, do not murder, and we've turned it into a pretty pretty big task at hand for this week. And as we wrap up this morning, I want to leave you guys with uh, an interesting piece of history that uh, I stumbled across this week. Many of you are familiar with King Henry II, my man with the awesome beard. Uh, King Henry II ruled England from 1154 to 1189 AD. Um, I think it's safe to say Henry had a lot of power. 
He put an end to a long and bloody civil war. He ruled both England and a large chunk of France for many years. And for the most part, he was, he was a pretty decent king. But what made he- King Henry II most famous was the fact that the power that he had in his position actually turned a flash of anger into an actual murder. He actually said words that became murder. Uh, and I'll tell you that story right now. Uh, he and Thomas Beckett, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, they were locked in this life and death power struggle between church and state. They, they had been friends for some time, but at this point, uh, their differences had caused incredible and great conflict. And this was no secret to, to the people in England at the time. But in a moment of incredible rage and frustration while arguing in court, the king cried out, Will no one rid me of this meddlesome priest? Will no one rid me of this meddlesome priest? Well, four of the king's more ambitious and, we'll say, unscrupulous knights heard that and said, We can do something about this. And that night, four of them got on their horses and rode to Canterbury and murdered Thomas in the front of the high altar, high altar of the cathedral. This, this caused Henry to be very distraught, and, and by way of penance, he ended up walking barefoot and in sackcloth for more than 50 miles from London to Canterbury. But my question for us this morning is what do you think God cared about more? His anger towards Thomas that caused him to say what he said or the knights who murdered him? Was it the will or the deed itself? My charge this morning, and I think if we have, have looked at this verse properly and within its context, I think it's quite clear that Henry's hatred would have mattered to God whether or not those four men got on their horses. Because it wouldn't have happened had Henry sought reconciliation rather than lashing out in anger. Now, I'm, I'm positive that this week you're not going to get mad at a buddy at work and say something that's going to cause four guys on horses to track him down 50 miles and whack him. But what's going on in our hearts this week? Are we going to be marked by love? Or are we going to allow a root of bitterness to fester? Are we going to allow ourselves to be turned into heart-level murderers this week? My prayer for us is obviously no. (laughs) But guys, life is important to God. Every life is important to God, and how we respond and how we interact with life is important to God. Jesus says the most important commandment is to love God and love your neighbor. And if we hate our neighbor, we are hating somebody who has been created in the image of God, and God does not take that lightly this week. So, let's get out there and love this week. Let's get out there and be known as people who, as Jesus said, they will know that you are my disciples because of your love for one another. So this week, let's seek to be seen as followers of Christ. Let's pray. Father, this morning, I just pray that you would challenge my heart with this. God, this, th- these 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 precepts that you're taking us through, through the Sermon on the Mount, these, these, these commandments. God, it's, it's nothing light. It's not easy stuff. It was never meant to be. God, it's designed to give us an appreciation for your holiness, for your justice, but God, also an appreciation of your love for humanity and the grace that you extend to us. Father, I just thank you for the free gift of salvation that allows us to understand the significance of these things, to recognize that life is not just about the here and the now, but God looking towards eternity. God, I just thank you for for all those here this morning who have taken hold of that gift of salvation. And God, if there's any who haven't, I just pray that you would arrest their heart, Father, that you would just convince them of their need for you, and that you would just draw them to yourself. And Father, for for us here this morning, as we go our separate ways, I ask that you would bless each one, that you would 
spur us on to good works, not because they save, but because they show the evidence of our faith in you, God. God, we thank you that you are not a God of hate, but a God of love and compassion, but also a God of justice, God. Help us to recognize that this week. Help us to love one another the way that you have called us to. And God, thank you so much for this time that we've had. I just ask that you bless each one in Christ's name. Amen. All right, we will see you guys next week.